Hi, welcome to the Juno Files. I'm Jim Juno, and this is where we talk to authors who write books about Hollywood, TV, movies, and anything really in between. So I have with me today, his name is Christian Blavelt, and he has a new book out. It's from the Turner Classic Movies Collection. It's called Hollywood Victory, the Movies, Stars, and Stories of World War II. Welcome, Christian. Oh, Jim, thank you so much for having me on. This means so much. No problem at all. I appreciate you being here. Now, this deals with a subject matter which, well, let's see, it's actually this week is Veterans Day. Yeah. So it's kind of appropriate. But this deals with something which we're, we don't see anymore. It's where Hollywood came together. Uh, and we're talking every aspect of Hollywood came yeah. together to become, I guess, would you, would you call it the world's biggest propaganda machine for World War sense. II? Yeah, in a, in a sense. I think that's, that's a fair description. Um, I think that, you know, this was a time where Hollywood really embraced the idea that it was going to be the, the mouthpiece for America, but also really definitively um, America's greatest cultural export, that the messages that, th that they would bake into their films about fighting the Nazis, fighting Imperial Japan, fighting Italian fascism would, you know, were, were, were messages that wouldn't just resonate within America and, and inspire America, but could really be seen and listened to by our allies all around the world. And it was the first time where the U.S., movie industry really embraced this idea of, of leadership. It wasn't just that they were making movies to entertain any longer. It wasn't just about, you know, making money or um, presenting images of glamour. It was really about a genuine sense of leadership, of being a cultural leader for the world, of being, of espousing certain ideas and ideals and, uh, and, and setting up very clearly what it was that we were fighting against. And, it, and amazingly, it wasn't just one aspect of Hollywood. It was the actors, it was the screenwriters, it was the studios. Every, every aspect of Hollywood came together for, to promote United States and freedom around the world during World War II. It's so true. It's so true. And that unity is something that, you know, was really a novelty because even just a few years before, there definitely wasn't that level of unity in Hollywood. There were, you know, very different views about how the industry should respond to the global crisis. You know, it was, it was apparent almost as soon as the Nazis took power in Germany in 1933 that they were evil guys and would have to be dealt with at one time or another. And, you know, so, some studios, you know, Warner Brothers in particular, um, took a stand, you know, without, you know, having to be forced into it. Um, they eventually closed their office in Berlin and, um, you know, decided to pursue more uh, a film like Confessions of a Nazi Spy that um, took on the Nazis and exposed their ideology as being as morally corrupt and bankrupt as we all know it, it was. But, uh, you know, there were others in Hollywood who really felt that, well, Germany is a, is a great source of business. It's the, mm -hmm. the largest international market for their films. Um, and there was also a feeling since, except for uh, Daryl of Zanuck of 20th Century Fox, all the, the, the studio heads were Jewish. I think there really was a feeling that taking on the Nazis in their films or engaging with them in any kind of combative way could make life worse for Jewish people living in Germany uh, and eventually in, in the other places that, that the Nazis had power. So, you know, th there were a lot of concerns and, and, and a lot of uh, different views about how to take this on and how to come together. And, and, and ultimately it wasn't clear at all that the industry could come together and face, and face this threat as a unified front. It was, you know, starting to head a little bit more in that direction in the couple years leading up to December 7th, but it was really Pearl Harbor that just changed everything. And, exactly. Uh, yeah. 
I can remember, and you you did write your book into five different parts, and that's what I, I really loved about it was that it wasn't. It shows that this wasn't something that happened overnight. Oh. You know it, um, and I I think it's kind of odd. <laughs> if I read this somewhere, it's the Three Stooges were the first people to actually make fun of Hitler. Yeah, that's right. The Three Stooges short, uh, You Nasty Spy, uh, was actually predated The Great Dictator, Chaplin's film. Uh, It came out some months before that, and it had a similar sensibility to it and a similar similar lingo, you know, like in The Great Dictator, the two countries that Chaplin's lampooning are Tomania and Bacteria, (laughs) uh, standards for Germany and Italy. And uh, in the Three Stooges short, You Nasty Spy, it was Moronica. That was the name of the country. And uh, <laughs> no, I think it's, it's interesting because there was this real feeling that, you know, comedy could be a powerful weapon in laying bare just how empty and evil and, uh, you know, cor- corrupt and compromised and every- everything, you know, the, the Nazi ideology was. Um, and, uh, and, and that, you know, comedy can be very threatening. And that's one of the things like, we, we ultimately think that maybe Hitler did see the great dictator. He just probably could not resist um, <laughs> and, and did seek it out. But um, you know, comedy is very threatening. If you, if you, so, you know, some dictatorial figures feel like that if you laugh at them, you take them down a peg. And uh, so when the, the, the fact that the Three Stooges did that was, was extremely meaningful. And like you said, it was uh, when, when I was in college uh, many years ago, back when we still watched the flickering of the of the of the projector, um, we studied this this period, and our, I remember our professor saying that all Nazis were German, but not all Germans were Nazis. Yeah, that's and right. That's what the studios had to contend with, was that there was, like you said, the major market in Germany was was very tempting to keep up sure yeah and uh you know up until pearl harbor um you know louis b mayer when overseeing mrs miniver uh there's that classic scene where Rear garson uh is confronted by the downed nazi flyer played by Mm -hmm. himself who in real life actually had been in a concentration camp and was a refugee of the nazis uh, he, you know, plays this down Nazi flyer and initially like Louis B. Mayer was like, let's, you know, soft pedal the scene a bit more. He's not mm-hmm. like an ideologue. He's not like drinking the Kool-Aid completely <laughs> on Hitler's, uh, agenda. Uh, and he didn't even want Mrs. Miniver to slap him, but eventually, you know, I mean, then Pearl Harbor happened and then it was an overnight. It was, it was different. Like, okay, you know what? William Wyler, the way that you wanted to shoot that scene, we'll, we'll go with your version. He can be one of Hitler's little madmen. And, uh, but there was a real, yeah, there was, there was a real approach avoidance yeah. with uh, this issue leading up to that. And um, no, it's, it's a fascinating thing. But what you said, you know, is that, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, let's face it, the, the, the vast majority of Germans at this time living in Germany either supported the Nazi regime or w- were at least content to stand by and not protest it, you know, Correct. Yeah. Rise up against it. You know, Italy to its credit, that's one of the amazing things about the war is that they ultimately did rise up against Mussolini, <laughs> you know? I mean, that's that's an incredible thing. Uh, they, they did rise up against him and, uh, you know, on a couple of occasions really, and then ultimately, you know, hung him upside down. But um, with, with Germany, it was that, you know, there obviously were a lot of emigre, a lot of refugees from the Nazis who settled in, in California. Not all of them were, uh, not all of them were Jewish. A good number were, uh, but in some way they'd, they'd been persecuted by the Nazis. And, you know, they then found this, themselves in this really strange situation of having to play Nazis on screen. And, uh, and, and so, you know, you have people like Conrad Veidt, who fled because he was married to a, Jew, a Jewish woman. Mm-hmm. Uh, he comes to Hollywood, ends up playing, you know, this uh, evil Nazi figure, Major Strasser in Casablanca. Yes. yes. <laughs> and you have so many of these. Marlena Dietrich, you know, performed for the Allied troops on the front lines and recorded 
songs and messages to broadcast into Germany to try to reach fellow Germans and be like, hey, this is crazy. You got to overthrow this madman, you know, stop this. Exactly. And, and uh, so it's it's a very complex time. And there's, there's just so much interesting stuff like that to dig into. But then Pearl Harbor happens. And while they still kind of, uh, they still wanted to keep the, the German market at least semi-friendly, Japan, forget it. I mean, they were, they were treated as animals. Yeah, I mean, it's confronting Japan. It's an interesting thing because immediate, you know, if, if Hitler and the Nazis had not declared war on the US, there probably still would have been enough of an isolationist movement in the US to say, we don't need to declare war on them. Just because Japan has attacked us and they've obviously declared war on us, we don't need to declare war on Germany as well. But four days after Pearl Harbor, Hitler and, uh, you know, it's believed really at his own discretion, at his own decision, uh, declared war on the US. And so now suddenly we're fighting two different powers on different continents. And in Hollywood, those initial films that really engaged with World War II and were about action in World War II, yeah, were largely directed to, toward the Japanese um, for a number of reasons. I mean, obviously Pearl Harbor was such a, a viscerally felt experience, but you know, in Los Angeles and throughout California, there literally were genuine worries that Japan might invade that bombing raids, at least by Japanese bombers, could, could happen over Los Angeles. There was a whole incident of panic a couple of nights before the 1942 Academy Awards in which people thought that a Japanese air raid was imminent. And so anti-aircraft fire was shot into the air. People, you know, panicked. There were like five deaths, like from people having heart attacks or getting into car accidents. I think maybe even someone was hit by um, some anti-aircraft ammunition. And, um, you know, and, and some of that was not, you know, entirely unjustified in that, you know, a Japanese submarine actually did open fire on the, the ocean front in Santa Barbara. They actually were trying to, uh, you know, hit the, the oil fields near Santa Barbara. And there were like Japanese balloon attacks that actually did kill a few people yes. on the US mainland. And so I think it was just that the, the immediate threat of Japan was just that much more um, that they were targeted first and, 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 mm -hmm. and viciously, as you said. I mean, the, the characterizations by Hollywood during that time are almost uniformly racist. And- uh, It was a, wasn't it? Um... Uh, Orson Welles, camera person, no, uh, videographer. Yeah, um, Greg Collins, a cinematographer Cohen. on Citizen Kane. So that's a perfect example. Uh, he made a film called December 7th, the movie, um, which was like a 90 minute documentary, basically just a 90 minute invective, 90 minute screed against, uh, uh, against Japan and against Japanese Americans. Um, and, uh, you know, with the, the US military officials for whom it was commissioned saw it and were like, this is horrific. We can't actually run this. You know, this is like, even for, you know, a, a US military that at that time was in support of interning Japanese Americans, they felt that that film was too racist, and that, which really gives you a sense of the racism <laughs> at, at heart there. Uh, so John Ford like took it away. He was working for the Navy at that time. Uh, took it away from Toland and uh, recut it and presented it instead in like a half hour version. And that version actually did go on to win an Oscar for, for best documentary, I think in 1943. But it's, it's shocking. Yeah. I mean, that, that was one of the things that, you know, in doing research for this book, like, you know, generally I feel that, you know, either neutral or at least, or better about mm -hmm. most of the people who I um, investigated and researched, but uh, Greg Toland, you know, such an innovator, um, Citizen Kane, The Letter, The Best Years of Our Lives. I, I, despite all those great films, I will say that my opinion of him definitely did decrease. Yeah. You also, you also touch base with, uh, well, one, the stars who, who were killed during World War II doing their part, uh, you know, with uh, Carol Lombard and, and Glenn Miller and um, Leslie Howard. That's right. Those are the top three that come to my mind. Yeah, you're exactly right. You know, we still don't know what happened with Glenn Miller. Um, he just, you know, flew out over the English Channel and was never seen again. Um, 
such a tragedy, you know, but Carol Lombard uh, was the first major Hollywood death. Uh, she died on January 16th, 1942, mm -hmm. just six weeks after Pearl Harbor, after returning to, she was trying to return to LA from a war bonds fundraising trip that she had done. And, uh, you know, her plane crashed with, with all souls aboard lost uh, into Mount Potosi about like 30 miles outside of Las Vegas. And uh, that hit home to the industry, just, you know, that this was someone who had really been trying to do her part. And, um, you know, and now she was gone. And so, you know, Gable, of course, her, um, her husband, Clark Gable, uh, you know, joined up. He joined the Army Air Forces and, uh, and, and fought, you know, the Nazis in his own way as an aerial gunner. Uh, in a B-17 over over Fortress Europe on a few missions. And, Jimmy uh, Stewart also. Jimmy Stewart too. Jimmy Stewart even more. He actually did like 23, 24 missions. Um, and eventually Jimmy Stewart was just commanding hundreds of men. He actually rose from the ranks of private first class, or maybe not even first class initially <laughs> uh, when he started and uh, ended up by the time of like D-Day and the end of the war being um, a colonel yeah. and commanding hundreds of men. And that's, you know, one of the, um, in American history, actually, just, you know, even take the Hollywood part out of it. One of the most impressive um, rises through the ranks uh, in any war. I mean, there are a few other examples of that, but um, in the civil war as well, someone starting as like a private and then rising up to all the way. Eventually Jimmy Stewart, you know, he was in the reserves through at least like the Vietnam era. And I think he, retired finally as a brigadier general i thought uh, i think so yeah and that's yeah. and then you have then you have the stars who gave gave their time i mean you mentioned marlena dietrich and but bob hope comes to mind i mean yeah. that's that's the one that my dad used to always tell me about was oh yeah bob hope we got to watch him on tv because he was there for us that's right that's right yeah this was you know the beginning of this decade spanning relationship that he had with the military where he entertained so many soldiers, sailors and airmen and, you know, every, you know, Marines. I mean, he went everywhere, globe trotted uh, to, to entertain the troops and, and did so with such gusto and brought other celebrities with him. Um, there was an incident even when I think he was flying to Australia during the war where his plane crashed and he had to like bail out and throw his luggage out the side of the plane and all this. And yeah, I mean, you know, the thing is, you could be an entertainer, but you, know, you could still be putting yourself in harm's way. I mean, certainly Carol Lombard proved that, but, yeah. you know, even like Mickey Rooney, now he actually did join up. He was in uniform after Louis B. Mayer tried to pull some strings to ensure that he would never uh, serve in uniform. But I think Rooney himself did want to serve and, and ultimately did so with relish and, uh, you know, entertained the troops, like put on Jeep shows, you know, where you just like stand on top of a Jeep and perform, mm -hmm. do sing some songs, tell some jokes, all that. You know, he did that on the front lines and he ultimately won a bronze star. So it's, it's a really impressive thing, like for someone who took a long time to get into, uniform you know ultimately winning a bronze star i mean that's nothing to sneeze at it's very impressive let's uh i don't mean to open up a controversial can of worms here but let's talk about john wayne during his uh, uh, world war ii so um, you know yeah i mean it seems like john wayne was perhaps unlike mickey rooney like actively trying to avoid service in part because he was so worried about what would happen to his career it was not an unfounded worry because mm -hmm. some people who went off to the war really did have their careers suffer as a result. I mean, I don't think, I don't think Clark Gable was ever as big a star um, because, you know, he missed those few years in Hollywood, but also just because I, I think with Gable, I think his grief and everything over losing his wife uh, sent him into okay, more okay. alcoholism yeah. and everything and kind of, you know, it, it veered his career a bit off course. Uh, but there are others. I mean, Mickey Rooney, I mean, yeah, he never had the same career once he came back. Um, and so John Wayne, I think, was was really worried that it could have a real effect on, on um, you know, his future prospects in Hollywood. And so really was, you know, I think there was always a feeling in the back of his mind, like, okay, I'll do one more movie, then I'll join up. Yeah. I'll do one more. And, then, and it just kept, it kind of kept snowballing until. I don't, I don't think John Ford ever forgave him for that. 
that's the thing, you know, that's what's, that's, what's really sad. I mean, I, I do uh, feel like that John Ford always would bring that up, would always kind of, because he joined up, you know, he was in the Naval Reserves from like mm-hmm. the thirties or something. And then he, you know, transitioned to active service, you know, well before Pearl, Har- Pearl Harbor. Um, and, uh, and so he never forgave Wayne, I think for, for this and always, use that as sort of a cudgel to make him feel less about himself in the years ahead. And I think that's part of why if there's this feeling today that Wayne is such a jingoistic kind of ultra macho cartoon in a way, so at least in his later years, um, you know, the way, the way that he, uh, you know, were to believe that he, you know, had to be restrained backstage when like Sashi and Littlefeather came out to <laughs> accept Marlon Brando's Oscar. Like all of these images that we have of him as being someone who essentially was bigoted and, well, I mean, not essentially, I mean, was bigoted based on his yeah. comments that he gave like in an interview to Playboy and everything. I mean, no question about it, he was. A lot of that does feel like it was driven from this desire to overcompensate for having missed out on this pivotal moment where he could have really lived some of the macho ideals that he went on to espouse later mm-hmm. on. And since he couldn't live those, he had to perform them and articulate them so strenuously. And uh, I think what many would regard as an offensive way today. Now, after, after the war, now World War II just didn't change Hollywood for, for being pro-American in the propaganda. But after the war, it opened up a lot more, um, well, I want to say opened up a lot more minds because you had African-Americans sure. looked in a new light. Um, America was looked in a new light. Yeah, very much so. Um, the idea of America as being a the cultural capital of filmmaking worldwide um, was really, you know, it was enshrined forever. I think it really is this this idea that movies are America's greatest cultural export. Um, that hadn't really existed before World War II because different countries had their own national cinemas and they certainly did after World War II as well. And they certainly rebounded in a really meaningful way. I mean, part of the reason why the forties are my favorite movie decade is that, um, you know, after the war you have such an amazing flourishing of new filmmakers from from Italy and from Japan and you know all over the world France as well um but I think it's just that the idea of American cultural power was never stronger than at this particular moment and that's something that lasted this kind of Pax Americana lasted all through the Cold War years and you know up until very recently um and uh that's, that's a really powerful thing. I mean, this is the idea of America as a superpower, politically, militarily, and culturally, um, was, was really enshrined during World War II. And, and Hollywood, at least in, on the cultural front, was, was a huge, huge part of that. Fantastic. Well, the book is called Hollywood Victory, the Movies, Stars, and the Stories of World War II. The author is Christian Blavelt. I hope I pronounced that right, Christian. Yes, yeah, you got it on the first <laughs> time. Fantastic. Well, I appreciate you being on the Juno Files tonight. Uh, Jim, thank you so much for having me on here. I hope you enjoy the book, and I hope your readers give it a look. That's right. And if you want to, if you want to see more of the book, find out more of the book, you can go to Amazon or you can go to RunningPress.com. And it was a, a synopsis there, if I can get the words out, you know, and, uh, but again, I appreciate you taking time, Christian, for doing this. And I appreciate the invite. Uh, thank you so much for your interest. And, uh, you know, to all, all the veterans out there, uh, people like your parents, you know, your father who served and your mom who uh, drove an ambulance mm-hmm. during the war. I mean, we, we thank them for their service. That greatest generation that fought the war, that fought World War II, they gave birth to the world that we've lived in ever since. And that's something to be celebrated and cherished. Fantastic. Well, take care. And that's the Juno Files for now.